how much the principals need to deny Tom Ridge's revelation that he was pressured to raise the terror threat level just days before President Bush was reelected in November 2004. How much they still need to push back against our reporting of the last four years about the nexus of politics and terror, underscored by this. In our third story in the countdown, Donald Rumsfeld today defended himself by turning to Osama bin Laden. In his new book, the former Homeland Security Secretary, Mr. Ridge, writing, Attorney General John Ashcroft strongly urged an increase in the threat level and was supported by Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. There was absolutely no support for that position within our department, none. I wondered, is this about security or politics? Mr. Ashcroft, speaking through his former spokesman at the Justice Department, saying, didn't happen. Now would be a good time for Mr. Ridge to use his emergency duct tape. But from Mr. Rumsfeld's office, more of an attempt in a statement which reads in part, the storyline advanced by his publisher seemingly to sell copies of the book is nonsense. In his defense, incredibly, Rumsfeld also quotes frequently and at length Osama bin Laden. Given those facts, the statement continues as if there were facts, it would seem reasonable for senior administration officials to discuss the threat level, talking about the time before the 2004 election. Indeed, it would have been irresponsible had that discussion not taken place. All of that carefully missing the point. Mr. Ridge knew the discussion had to take place after a new bin Laden tape was released. He writes about that at length. Most notably, the timing of the tape may have been a surprise. The content was not. From September 11, 2001 to this video broadcast, there had been nearly 20 audio and videotapes attributed to either bin Laden or his lieutenant. A threatening message, audio or visual, should not be the sole reason to elevate the threat level. Our reporting on this issue began in October 2005 and was inspired by remarks made the previous May by, by Mr. Ridge himself. More often than not, he had said to an interviewer after his resignation from Homeland Security, we were the least inclined to raise it. Sometimes we, his department, disagreed with the intelligence assessment. Sometimes we thought even if the intelligence was good, you don't necessarily put the country on alert. There were times when some people were really aggressive about raising it, and we said, for that, the latest revised edition now of the Nexus of Politics and Terror. Number one, May 18th, 2002. The first details of the president's daily briefing of August 6, 2001 are revealed, including its title, Bin Laden Determined to Strike in U.S. The same day, another memo is discovered revealing the FBI knew of men with links to al-Qaeda training at an Arizona flight school. The memo was never acted upon. Questions about 9-11 intelligence failures are swirling. May 20th, 2002. The terror warnings from the highest level Levels of the federal government tonight are just two days later. Warning. FBI Director Mueller declares that another terrorist attack is inevitable. Tonight, there are even more warnings. The of next possible day, the Department of Homeland Security issues warnings of attacks against railroads nationwide and against New York City landmarks like the Brooklyn Bridge and the Statue of Liberty. That agility that number two, uh, Dr. Mueller was Thursday, June 6, 2002. I never really anticipated this kind of impact. Colleen um, Rowley, wrote the FBI. Agent who tried Miller to alert her superiors to the specialized flight um, training taken by Zacharias no, Musawi, whose I, information suggests the government the missed a chance years. to break up the 9-11 plot, FBI testifies before have, Congress. Kind of hard to Senate Intelligence Committee Chair Graham says Rowley's testimony has inspired similar pre-9-11 whistleblowers. Monday, June 10th, 2002, four days later. We have disrupted an unfolding terrorist plot. Speaking from Russia, Attorney General John Ashcroft reveals that an American named Jose Padilla is under arrest, accused of plotting a radiation bomb attack in this country. In fact, Padilla had by this time already been detained for more than a month. After five years of detention and possibly torture, psychiatrists find Padilla is so traumatized he's no longer mentally fit to stand trial. He is nonetheless convicted of conspiracy, but is never tried nor even charged with any so-called dirty bombs nor with attempted terrorism in the United States. Number three, February 5th, 2003, Secretary of State Powell tells the U.N. Security Council of Iraq's concealment of weapons, including 18 mobile biological weapons laboratories, justifying a U.N. or U.S. first strike. Many in the U.N. are doubtful. Months later, much of the information proves untrue. 
February 7, 2003, two days later, as anti-war demonstrations protesting the imminent invasion of Iraq continue to take place around the globe. Take some time to prepare for an emergency. Homeland Security Secretary Ridge cites credible threats by al-Qaeda and raises the terror alert level to orange. Three days after that, Fire Administrator David Paulison, who would become the acting head of FEMA after the Hurricane Katrina disaster, advises Americans to stock up on plastic sheeting and duct tape to protect themselves against radiological or biological attack. Number four, July 23rd, 2003. The White House admits that the CIA, months before the president's State of the Union address, expressed strong doubts about the claim that Iraq had attempted to buy uranium from Niger. On the 24th, the congressional report on the 9-11 attacks is issued. It criticizes government at all levels. It reveals an FBI informant had been living with two of the future hijackers. It concludes that Iraq had no link to al-Qaeda. 28 pages of the report are redacted. On the 26th, American troops are accused of beating Iraqi prisoners. July 29th, 2003, three days later, amid all of the negative headlines. Word of a possible new al-Qaeda attack. Homeland Security issues warnings of further terrorist attempts to use airplanes for suicide attacks. Number five, December 17th, 2003. 9-11 Commission co-chair Thomas Kane says the attacks were preventable. The next day, a federal appeals court says the government cannot detain suspected radiation bomber Jose Padilla indefinitely without charges, and the chief U.S. weapons inspector in Iraq, Dr. David Kay, who has previously announced he has found no weapons of mass destruction there, announces he will resign his post. December 21st, 2003, four days later, the Sunday before Christmas. Today, the United States government raised the national threat level. Homeland Security again raises the threat level to orange, claiming credible intelligence of further plots to crash airliners into U.S. cities. Subsequently, six international flights into this country are canceled after some passenger names purportedly produced matches on government no-fly lists. The French later identify those matched names. One belongs to an insurance salesman from Wales, another to an elderly Chinese woman, a third to a five-year-old boy. Number six, March 30th, 2004. The new chief weapons inspector in Iraq, Charles Dulfer, tells Congress, we have still not found any WMD in that country. And after weeks of having refused to appear before the 9-11 Commission, Condoleezza Rice relents and agrees to testify. On the 31st, four Blackwater USA contractors working in Iraq are murdered. Their mutilated bodies dragged through the streets and left on public display in Fallujah. The role of civilian contractors contractors in Iraq is now widely questioned. April 2, 2004. The FBI has issued a new warning tonight. To Homeland Security issues a bulletin warning that terrorists may try to blow up buses and trains using fertilizer and fuel bombs like the one detonated in Oklahoma City bombs stuffed into satchels or duffel bags. Number seven, May 16th, 2004. Secretary of State Powell appears on Meet the Press. The late Tim Russert closes by asking him about the enormous personal credibility Powell had placed before the UN in laying out a case against Saddam Hussein. An aide to Powell interrupts the question, saying the interview is over. I think that was one of your staff, Mr. Secretary. I don't think that's appropriate. Get this Emily Galloway. Powell finishes his answer, admitting that much of the information he had been given about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq was, uh, was inaccurate and uh, wrong, and in some cases deliberately misleading. On the 21st, new photos showing mistreatment of Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib prison are released. On the 24th, Associated Press video from Iraq confirms U.S. forces mistakenly bombed a wedding party, killing more than 40. Wednesday, May 26, 2004, two days later. Good afternoon. Attorney General Ashcroft Today, and FBI Mueller Director and Mueller Attorney General warned that intelligence from multiple sources indicates al-Qaeda's specific intention to hit the United States hard. And that 90 percent of the arrangements for an attack on the United States were complete. The color-coded warning system is not raised. The Homeland Security Secretary, Tom Ridge, does not attend the announcement. Number eight, July 6, 2004.
2004. Pre Democratic presidential States candidate John Kerry Senator selects John Senator, Senator John Edwards as his vice presidential running mate, producing a small bump in the election opinion polls and, and producing a huge swing in media years. attention towards the Democratic campaign. To July 8, 2004, two days later, credible reporting now indicates that al-Qaeda is moving forward with its plans to carry out a large-scale attack in the United States. Homeland Secretary Ridge to warns of information about al-Qaeda attacks during the summer or autumn. Four days after that, the head of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, DeForest B. Soares Jr., confirms he has written to Ridge about the prospect of postponing the upcoming presidential election in the event it is interrupted by terrorist acts. Number 9, July 29, 2004. At their party convention in Boston, the Democrats formally nominate John Kerry as their candidate for president. As in the wake of any convention, the Democrats now dominate the media attention over the subsequent weekend. August 1, 2004. Monday morning, three days later. It is as reliable a uh, group of sources that we've ever seen before. The Department of Homeland Security raises the alert status for financial centers in New York, New Jersey, and Washington to orange. The evidence supporting the warning, reconnaissance data left in a home in Iraq, later proves to be roughly four years old and largely out of date. Number 10, October 6, 2005, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. The president addresses the National Endowment for Democracy, once again emphasizing the importance of the war on terror and insisting his government has broken up at least 10 terrorist plots since 9-11. At 3 p.m. Eastern Time, five hours after the president's speech has begun, the Associated Press reports that Karl Rove will testify again to the CIA leak grand jury, and that Special Prosecutor Fitzgerald has told Rove he cannot guarantee that he will not be indicted. We're awaiting a news conference at the bottom of the hour. New York City At 5.17 p.m. Eastern Time, seven hours after the president's speech has begun, New York officials disclose a bomb threat to the city's subway system based on information supplied by the federal government. A Homeland Security spokesman says the intelligence upon which the disclosure is based is of doubtful credibility. And it later proves that New York City had known of the threat for at least three days and had increased police presence in the subways long before making the announcement Major at that Ed particular M1 time. Minutes. Local New York television station WNBC reports it had the story of the threats days in advance of the announcement but was asked by high-ranking federal officials in New York and Washington to hold off on its story. Less than four days after having revealed the threat, Mayor Michael Bloomberg of New York says, since the period of the threat now seems to be passing, I think over the immediate future we'll slowly be winding down the enhanced security. While news organizations ranging from the New York Post to NBC News quote sources who say there was reason to believe the informant who triggered the warning simply made it up. A senior U.S. counterterrorism official tells the New York Times, quote, there was no there there. Number 11, a sequence of events in August 2006 best understood now in chronological order. As the month begins, the controversy over domestic surveillance without legal warrants in this country crests. Then on August 9th, the day after the Connecticut Democratic senatorial primary, Vice President Cheney says the victory of challenger Ned Lamont over incumbent Joe Lieberman is a positive for the, quote, al-Qaeda types, who he says, quote, clearly are betting on the proposition that ultimately they break the will of the American people in terms of our ability to stay in the fight. The next day, British authorities arrest 24 suspects in an alleged imminent plot to blow up U.S.-bound aircraft using liquid explosives smuggled on board in sports drink bottles. Domestic air travel is thrown into chaos as carry-on liquids are suddenly banned. On August 14th, British intelligence reveals it did not think the plot was imminent, only the U.S. did, and our authorities pressed to make the arrests. 11 of the 24 suspects are later released, and in 
the months to come, the carry-on liquids ban is repeatedly relaxed. Number 12, May 7, 2007. Greensburg, Kansas, leveled by a tornado, and the state's then-governor notes, more in sorrow than in anger, that the redeployment of so much of the Kansas National Guard and its equipment to Iraq might now cripple the soldiers' ability to respond if another disaster hits Kansas. What we're really missing is equipment, and that is putting a strain on recoveries like this one. Plan the next day, the authorities announce the arrests out. in a far-fetched plan to attack soldiers at Fort Dix in New Jersey. The so-called terrorists plan to gain access to the base by posing as pizza delivery men. It is not a suicide mission. They state clearly they intend to kill personnel and then retreat to safety, even though they were going to attack a closed compound full of trained soldiers with weapons. And though the plan is branded sophisticated, its perpetrators are not sophisticated enough to have not handed over the videotape of themselves training with weapons to a Circuit City store in order to be transferred to DVD. The Fort Dix plot not only erases from most news coverage the issue of disaster readiness in Kansas, but it also obscures the next day's story that in anticipation of his testimony to a House you panel, Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez has submitted right. opening remarks that match virtually word for word the remarks he had given the previous month to a Senate committee. Recognizing my limited involvement, involvement in the process, a mistake. I freely acknowledge a mistake that I freely acknowledge. I have soberly questioned my prior decisions. And number 13, June 2007, the JFK plot to blow up the jet fuel pipeline feeding John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York City and thus causing the entire airport to be consumed in a horrific conflagration. One of the men arrested has, as a past employee, access to the sprawling complex, but little knowledge of the reality of the pipeline system. The manager of that system tells the New York Times that the Pipeline is not some kind of fuse. Shutoff valves throughout would have easily contained any damage, just as a leak in any tunnel in any city would not flood everything in that city below ground. A so-called plot happens to be revealed the day before the second Democratic presidential debate. And as the scandal continues to unfold over the firings of U.S. attorneys and their replacements by political hacks, the so-called plot is announced by the Bush-appointed U.S. attorneys for Brooklyn, New York and the police chief of New York City. But they would never, ever play politics with terror. Except that in addition to Mr. Ridge, there is a second key member of the Bush administration who thinks they very well may have. That and whether or not legally anything could still come of this with Jonathan Turley next on Countdown. In our number two story, the possible consequences of Tom Ridge's version of the nexus of politics and terror. If Mr. Ridge is demonized by Bush loyalists for those claims, who better to take counsel from than former White House Press Secretary Scott McClellan? In an email to Politico, quoting McClellan said, It is one thing if he is saying he simply felt it was politically motivated. It is quite another if he has specific information showing it was politically motivated. There is no question exploiting the war on terror was viewed by the political strategists as integral to branding the president as a strong and decisive leader who will keep America safe. If Secretary Ridge is making the serious allegation that the terror alert was driven primarily by political concerns late in the campaign, he is going to be expected to back it up with specific information. If he can, it is a serious matter. If he cannot, then I suspect critics will pounce. Let's bring in, as promised, George Washington University law professor, constitutional law expert, Jonathan Turley. John, good evening. Hi, Keith. Frame this for us. If political pressure was applied to raise the terror threat level in that instance or any other during the Bush administration, what does that amount to in terms of abuse of power, and is there still any avenue to prosecute it? Well, it is certainly an abuse of power. It's perhaps the worst form of abuse of power. National security has always been treated as inviolate, something that crossed party lines. Indeed, if you recall, it was a virtual mantra during the Bush administration that any time someone questioned a, a bill or a position of the government, they, you would have Bush himself or others saying, stop playing politics with national security. And yet, we see in books like this allegations that national security was being really manipulated and used as a prop. I mean, people like Ridge, who is obviously a very committed Republican, obviously do not like the fact that bin Laden is being treated like some type of RNC asset, that, mm -hmm. you know, when you need him, you sort of take him out of, uh, uh, you know, the backstage and bring him forward to terrify the children. And, you know, it's, it's the, the problem with this abuse of power is that it doesn't have an easy translation into the law. That is, it's not criminal. This this 
this, these different levels of, of um, threat um, are largely discretionary, if not mm -hmm. entirely discretionary, to the president. He can, in fact, and his underlings can, in fact, uh, play around with national security, and it's not a crime. But it most certainly is a betrayal of his oath if these allegations are true. And I think your program raises a very powerful series of events, a pattern where we have had these threats that occurred at very significant moments. Is it um, incumbent upon Ridge to try to provide more specific information um, to this claim, as Mr. McClellan suggests, or is th this is an entree to an investigation, or is there any chance of it going from here in any direction mm -hmm. officially? Well, you know, Keith, that's why they don't call these, you know, tell some books. I mean, you, when, you, when you get into an allegation like this, uh, you're in for a penny or a pound, and you need to uh, make good uh, the allegation. It's a very serious allegation, but it's not a new allegation. What Ridge is suggesting here, critics have said for a very long time, uh, that the Bush administration always seemed eager to keep fear alive, that, that national security had become their only selling point. Mm -hmm. They had basically lost on all the other political fronts. But what it, what it did then was create this really dangerous situation where danger was a commodity, that it was something that was being used not just politically but in courts uh, to roll back civil liberties uh, for arrests. It became an entire industry. In fact, I testified to Congress about how we still have this infrastructure from the Bush administration, which is occupied by people who are told and given a huge amount of money to find domestic threats. That's all they do. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a tendency when you have that large bureaucracy that's being paid to find domestic threats that they find them because it sort of perpetuates their existence. There's one other thing in the book here, and we can only go into this in the most brief detail, about Ridge describing when they raised the terror threat level for the financial centers in August 2004, right after the Democratic Convention. The White House asked him to add language to the, to the announcement which lauded Bush's leadership in the war on terror, and he did so. Is that, is there any violation in that, or is that, again, that discretionary stuff you talked about? Well, unfortunately, it is bad taste, bad policy, but it's not a crime. Mm. But it is an abuse of power again. That report is supposed to be a guarantee to the American people that this is the unvarnished, professional, apolitical uh, announcement of the types of risks we are facing. And basically, he's suggesting that the White House treated it like a press release for the president. Indeed it was. Jonathan Turley of George Washington University. As always, great thanks for the perspective, and have a great weekend. Thank you, Keith.